Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fire safety training. This is to cover us for the duration of COVID-19. My name's Kevin Connell. We're going to be going through certain aspects. Content here is going to be the different types of alarms, actions to be taken on hearing the alarms, the role of the fire wardens, your evacuation procedures, safety of electrical equipment, action when locating a fire, your fire extinguishers, how to use them, different types, understanding smoke and fire behaviour and we'll be finishing off on the ski pad bariatric ski mats. So a continuous fire alarm then is activating. If you are in a non-clinical area, you must, if it's safe to do so, close your windows, leave the room, close the door behind you and follow your nearest fire safety exit route which will take you outside the building to your assembly area everybody should know where your assembly areas are it's listed on your doorways when you come into the building it should also be in your logbook you must wait in that area until the fire warden has taken a roll call the fire warden at this point will be getting their yellow tabard and the logbook and will be making sure that everybody is leaving this building Once outside, you make sure that nobody else is coming into that building and you take a roll call. Continuous fire alarm in clinical areas, much more in depth. So the response here is all available staff will report to the main reception area. Nurse in charge will delegate a member of staff to go to the fire panel and report the findings on the panel. Remember, this will give you a bit of information. It will tell you the door number of where the smoke detector is activated. If a smoke detector has activated, it will be indicated by a red light. If there's no fire in that area and there's a red light on the smoke detector, you're going to know it's a false alarm. But just remember, it could be a fire. So somebody shouting a, a door number down the ward saying where it's, it's in, don't just walk into that room. Do your correct door entry procedures. Feel for the heat on the door. Open the door very slightly. If smoke comes out of it, close that door. If you open up the door, there's a small fire. We're only talking about something the size of a waste paper bin. You may decide to tackle the fire if safe to do so. If it's just a red light on the smoke detector, it's indicating a fault. So you know it's a false alarm. Up until that point, all the remaining staff are going to be checking all the areas. Remember, using your correct door entry procedures. Decision to evacuate, should there be a fire, is going to be taken by the person in charge. Never the fire warden. People are going to be searching for signs of fire. Checking the fire alarm panel, as we've said, will give you the precise location. You must dial 112 within two minutes. People aren't dialing this uh, number, the 112 number, uh, and it's something that we need to get around here. Last year, we had 119 fire alarms activated. At that 119 fire alarms, only 10 departments dialed 112. If you've got a fire, dial 112. If it's a false alarm, dial 112. It's a bit like if you've got a house fire, People are trapped in the house fire. You don't down 999 for some reason. Why? 112 is a, it's a key number in this trust. Remember outside the trust, it's 999. But inside the trust, the key number is 112. We must be dialing that as soon as possible. So we're dialing that if we come across a fire. If we know it's a fire, dial 112 immediately. Let them know it's a fire. If it's a false alarm... Let them know it's a false alarm. We'll check the room out. Smoke detector's showing a red light. We don't know why. Could be a fault on the system. Or if you've been searching for a while, you can't find anything. Again, dial 112 saying, we've been searching the area. There's no signs of fire. We can't find anything. We are still investigating. The estates department will be on their way up. Once you've found what it is, 
Whether it's a false alarm or a fire, again dial 112 to report your investigations. Yes, we've further investigated it. We found it to be a false alarm. Let them know 112 is a key number that we must be dialing. Failing to dial 112 may result in the fire service being mobilised. If they turn up and it's a false alarm, they may charge you. So the role of the fire warden then is to act as a focal point and take control of a fire related incident. We need to make sure that the area is evacuated quickly and safely without any help from the fire service. It's up to the warden department to have in place an effective system for managing the incident. So if you remember, we go by what we call the traffic light system, red, amber and green zone areas. So the green zone then, this is going to be a place of relative safety for us. We can move further away from this area if need be. So when you're moving people into this area, do not put them into a side room. You always need to be in an area where you can move further away from the fire if need be. So ultimately you're outside the building. The amber zone. This is going to be a logistics area because to evacuate the red zone area, you may need certain pieces of equipment. You may need ski pads. You may need oxygen cylinders. So that will be brought up into that area. And the red zone, this is going to be the danger area. This is where we need to get everybody out of as quickly and safely as possible. We will have a fire warden for each one of these zones. Under no circumstances will anybody be allowed past any of these fire wardens without proper authorisation, which is your ID badges. So if we look at this then now, right, so we've got Ward 1, which is on fire. Fire's out of control here. So it lists there, it shows you there, your red, amber and green zone areas. Now, your red zone warden should be monitoring the doors up here. And you'll have amber zone warden and green zone wardens up here and down here as well. And as we said, under no circumstances does anybody get past these fire wardens without proper authorisation. So, if a fire starts, and that's the ward that we're looking at there, the first people that you're going to evacuate is obviously the people that are in imminent danger. Where the fire is, you're going to get them out of that area. And after that, it's the next people closest to that room. So you're gradually moving people further and further away. So you're getting everybody out of the red zone through the first set of fire doors, into the next zone and then through the next set of fire doors which will take you into the green zone area. So on hearing an intermittent alarm then, if you hear an intermittent alarm the fire warden will go check the fire panel. On the fire alarm panel it will give you an indication of where the incident is taking place. So where you, you yell a tabard you will proceed to the area that is indicated on the fire panel, which in this case was Ward 1. Once you get there, they may be evacuating. The decision to evacuate, as we've said, will be taken by the person in charge. You're going to contact your own warden, ask for assistance. So once you've spoken to the Red Zone Warden, come away from that area, find a safe area with a landline phone, ring up your own department and tell them you have a serious fire here, we need all available staff up here as quickly as possible. At that point now, you will establish the amber zone area. You may need oxygen cylinders. You may need ski pads. So while you're on the phone, asking for further assistance from your own department, if you know what equipment you need, tell them over the phone. It'd be much easier if they bring it with up to your area with them rather than you delegating and once they get up there, it saves time. So here we have the Red Zone Warden and we have the Amber Zone Warden coming up acting on the intermittent alarm. They come up to the Red Zone Warden. Basically, they're asking what's going on. The Red Zone Warden is reporting that they have a serious fire here. They're having to evacuate. To evacuate this area, we need four oxygen cylinders and we need two ski pads. 
Once the Amber Zone Warden has received that information, this is where they come out of that area. This is where they find a safe phone, ring down to their own department, tell them we have a serious fire here, we need all available staff here as quickly as possible. At this moment in time now, other people are on the way up, so we've got staff, we've got porters coming from all areas at this point. They're coming up, passing the Green Zone Warden, the Amber Zone Warden. They're coming to aid and assist with the evacuation of the Red Zone area. Nobody must get past any of these areas without proper authorisation, so they must be showing the ID badges. But when they cross over from the Amber to the Red, the Red Zone Warden must take their ID badges. This is their way of logging you in. Those people will go in there, they will aid and assist with the evacuation of the Red Zone area. Once they're bringing people out and everybody's out of that area safely, the Red Zone Fire Warden will then give you your ID badge back. So we know everybody's out at that point. That's called closing the loop. We're logging people in and we're making sure that they've come out safely as well. So we're keeping a register. That's how we're keeping a register of, of the people that are going in and coming out. Please note that the estates, electricians and engineers, they'll be on the way up. They're going to be shutting down all your medical gases, oxygen and cylinders, right? So they, they need access there. Hopefully they've got their ID badges. Uh, they should have the uniforms anyway. And I think most people know the estates department. So I don't think there'll be much problem there, but they, they need to be getting access into that area. You need to keep the log books up to date with flammables and oxygen storage. Clearly marked on the plans, this is to hand over the fire service because if the fire service turn up and there is a serious fire, they need these plans, they need the information in that log book. So you need to keep up to date with your log book. You need to be doing your daily checks, you need to be doing your weekly checks. You need to keep them up to date. And remember, no ID badge, no entry, no exceptions. Your main option isolation shuts off valve located on your walls. This is what one looks like here. If you don't know where they are in your area, you need to find them. Any competent member of staff will be asked to turn this off. But again, the decision is from the person in charge. You must make sure that everybody is off piped oxygen and onto another supply of oxygen before this is turned off. And all you do is you just break the glass with a hard object, it breaks easily and it's just a lever on off. Some of your fire panels will look like this, this will give you all the kinds of information. It will give you uh, the location of the area where the fire alarm's activated. Some of them are just repeater panels. So if you hear an intermittent alarm, you're going along and you see a light on number 2. You'd look at the zone sector at the top there, it says zone 2 which is ward 7, so you proceed to ward 7. Right, electrical equipment, you, we want you to watch out for anything like this because this has the potential to be very dangerous, uh, in some cases even life-threatening. So if you come across anything like this, please report it. Scorch marks on sockets, sign of overheating. Or if you, even if you see cracked sockets, you need to report that as well. Extension leads. Extension leads are no longer allowed in the trust unless they are approved. They are now coming out with an approved uh, extension leads, which is uh, you can get them in four or six sockets, five amps on the four ones. Um, these are the new ones that are coming out. They're suited for IT equipment like um, your televisions and uh, your monitors, computers. If you put a toaster or a kettle in it, it will blow the, the fuse on it. So they're not designed for uh, toasters and kettles and microwaves. They're only designed for any type of ID, IT equipment. And they're, they're coming out shortly, so we'll be getting those shortly. Right, so remember, if you discover a fire, the number to call is 112. Can't stress this enough, you are not dialing this number, and I don't know why. Because we go up to you, we talk to you, did you dial the number, 112? Uh, no. Did you know about 112? Yes, we knew about it. Well, why didn't you dial it? Well, we don't know. You need to be that. Don't be afraid to dial it. You need to dial this number. Nobody's going to tell you off for it. 
The fire service are only sending one, possibly two fire appliances. If it's a serious fire, they're going to need a lot more than that. So you need to be dialing that one and two number as quickly as possible. Fire extinguishers then. We have two different types of fire extinguishers in the trust. Foam and CO2. This is a foam one here. The mechanics at the top of the extinguisher are, extinguishers are the same on both extinguishers. You have, as you can see, there's a carrying handle and a lever at the top. And in between those two, you have a little pin. You pull that pin, you squeeze those two levers together. The contents of the extinguisher come out of the, uh, the, the hose there or on the CO2, the nozzle. So this is a foam extinguisher then. This is what you're going to be using on things such as uh, paper, cardboard, uh, towels, blankets, stuff like that. And all you do is once you pull the pin, uh, just check it, make sure it's working before you actually approach the fire. And it's just like a sweeping motion uh, at the base of the fire. Now we're only talking about something that is the size of a waste paper bin. We don't want to be tackling anything else than that. And you'll be assessing it yourself. If you walk into a room, there's a small fire there. If you think you can put it out, make sure you've alerted everybody. You've got somebody with you. Try to put the fire out. Right, if it's something that you don't think you can handle, come out of the room, close the door on it, and then go through your process of alerting everybody, breaking your break glass call points, shouting fire, uh, and going into your evacuation mode. The ones for electrics then is the CO2 extinguisher. Again, the mechanics are the same at the top. You need to position the horn. Once you position the horn, you don't need to touch that again. Remember, it comes out of freezing cold fog cloud uh, and it can give you freeze burns if you hold on to that horn for any length of time. So don't hold on to it. Don't stand directly in front of anything glass because if that's red hot and you put something freezing cold onto that, it could shatter, uh, possibly cause injury. So stand to the side of it. If you can, if it's safe to do so, try to switch off the electrical socket because that's what was feeding the fire in the first place. And be careful in confined spaces uh, because it kills the fire by cooling it and starving it of oxygen. So if it's taking oxygen away from the fire, it's a possibility it can be doing the same with you in a small confined space. You all need to have uh, an evacuation strategy. Don't depend on the fire and rescue service to evacuate. They have every expectation that you will have your evacuation under where by the time they get there, they need to focus on the fire. Your evacuation strategy is going to fall into three stages, single stage evacuation, horizontal and delayed evacuation. Single stage then, used where occupants and patients fall into an independent category. That basically means that these are the people that, uh, on instructions, they can vacate the area quickly and safely. Horizontal evacuation, this is where patients are dependent on staff to evacuate them out. So you could have people that are, are movable, they're not in the beds. You can start asking them to walk out, you can direct them straight to the green zone area. But if you've got people, patients in their beds, you may have to start taking the beds out. Remember, always the ones closest to the fire first. And you can wheel the beds all the way out of the red into the amber and into the green. But remember, always working closest to the fire first. Right, delayed evacuation. It may be some areas where you may have to have a delayed evacuation. You may have, in surgery, uh, surgeons operating on a patient. They can't just close down that operation straight away. So that that situation has to be delayed we have to delay them so you'll find that in those areas that the doors could be up to as much as two hours fire protection but that fire protection is only protecting you if those doors are closed you keep those doors closed you are giving the surgeons time to close down the operation or if they're close to finishing the operation to complete it remember you are uh, and taking everybody into surgery if the fire alarm activates do not put anybody uh, under under the anaesthetic, don't don't be putting them to sleep. Once the fire alarm's activated, you need to find out what's going on first. 
So we've talked about keeping the doors uh, closed and it's vitally important that we keep those doors closed. These ones close when the fire alarm goes off. Uh, another one of your checks as a fire warden on a Thursday at uh, St Luke's and Wednesday at Bradford Royal. Once the alarm's been tested, these doors should close. So you need to make sure that they are closing. That's not going to close. So any obstructions, you need to remove the obstructions so they can close. Because if these doors are left open in a fire situation, it's going to it could prove fatal. So here we have an example fire. Quite extensive damage there. But as you see on the other side of the doors, there. It's held the fire back. This is the importance about keeping your doors closed. As you can see there, the fire has started down in this area here. This door was open, this door was open, and this door was open here. So you can see from the storeroom, the smoke and flames have quickly spread all the way along this area here, onto the staircase, and as it's got onto the staircase, it's very quickly gone up the staircase. Now, if you look here, that door's closed. That door's closed. Look at those people there. These people here, at this moment in time, are protected. But because we've left a door open on the staircase, right, what has actually happened there now is, although these people are safe for the time being, it's only a question of time before the smoke and flames come through that door. They have nowhere else to go at this point so it's vitally important that we keep the doors closed had this door been closed at the bottom here that point there the fire alarm would have gone off all these people would have been alerted they could have all come down this staircase and got outside the building before the smoke and flames came through that door there so again can't stress the importance about keeping your doors closed right any questions at this point? Okay, right. Going on to the ski pads now. Once you've got everybody out of this area, you may have to take patients down with a ski pad or the bariatric or the ski sheet, which is what we're going to go through now. So, the ski pad then. You'll see these hung up on the walls. You've all seen these. They're on hooks, as you can see. If you're asked to bring these to another area, just take it off the hook and take it up to the area that has uh, the evacuation underway. If it's already in that area, all you need to do is just pull that tab. Once you pull that tab, it will fall down at your feet. And all it is, it's a little mini mattress for transferring people from the bed, onto the mat, onto the floor, and down the staircase. And as you can see, it's got uh, two car seat belt patient type restraining straps, and it has a pocket at both ends. You have a little slider there. We'll cover that in a second. So what you need to do is you need to have the bed at good working height. Brake on. And with the help of the bedding, you need to roll the patient onto their side. Now make sure when you roll them on the side that you are supporting them. Get yourself right up to the bed so that they don't fall off the edge of the bed. If you can remember, try to feed the two short buckles underneath a patient because it's easier to feed that underneath a patient than it is along straps. Once you've got them in that position, put the slider underneath them and with the help of the slider, it acts as a pat slide. You just pull the patient back on to the mat. If you can remember, take this little slider away because when you're going down the staircase, they tend to slide down it a little bit. As you can see there, the feet have gone nicely in the pocket and the head is a couple of inches down from the top. Now this is a small lady, so these mats are only very small. So if you've got a tall person, you may need to take the feet out of the bottom pocket and put it so the feet are hanging over because in all circumstances, you need to protect the head. So you need the head two to three inches down from the top of the mat. You need to put pillars where the straps go. Once you've done that, if you can remember, try to pull the sides of the matting so that the straps pull nice and firmly tight. Any excess strap like he's holding up there, you need to tuck under the pillar out of the way because if it's dangling on the floor, you will trip over it going down the staircase. 
What we do now is we put the bed into a low position, we then put it into a tilting position and we drag the patient off the bottom of the bed and transfer them to the staircase. Now, if you're traveling a patient for any length of distance, the knee, you need to be pulling them head first because when you go through the doors, if you pull them feet first, the doors will be closing on the head. When you come to the staircase, they need to be going down feet first. As you can see there, just keep pulling to come right over the top step and they'll just glide down the staircase uh, nice and neatly. They don't go flying down the staircase, they just go, it's just, you're just controlling them as they go down. So that's the ski pad. The bariatric evacuation map then, right? Remember, you need to be setting up a peeps form for anybody that comes in with these. You need to be making sure that you can put these in an area in your ward where they can be easily evacuated. This is up to 56 stones, 350 kilograms. And if you look at it, it looks like a whole doll bag. There's two little clips around it. If you unfasten those clips, it rolls out like that and it opens up like that. Now this looks quite complicated. In actual fact, it's fairly straightforward, is this. Uh, and I'll explain why as we go along. If you can see to the side, it's got the two wing parts that wrap around the main section of the patient's body. At the top, it says head. That's so you know to put the head there. So at the bottom there, you're putting the feet in the bucket, bucket at the bottom. At the bottom, you see two straps. Once you've got the patient in place, those two straps come up over the feet and they're connecting to two plugs that are further up on the mat. And at the top there, it looks like a ladder. That's because there's going to be quite a few of you holding onto this patient when you're going down the staircase. There's all kinds of carrying handles all the way around this, so you're going to need quite a few members of staff. So these patients are brought out into a safe zone area along with everybody else, but when they do go down the staircase, remember they do go down last. But remember, you're bringing them out into a safe zone area. So again, we roll the patient on their side with the help of the bedding, support them to make sure that they don't fall off the edge of the bed. You've got the bed at a good working height and the brake on. Roll one side of the mat up because it's easier to fit that underneath the patient than it is the left hand side. That goes underneath the patient and then you have your slider. Your slider goes underneath the patient. You won't be able to get the slider out from underneath that patient once you've got them in place so leave it there and it's simple the two wing parts wrap around the main section of the patient's body and you can see at the bottom there the bucket part has come up over the feet that's it there and the two wing parts there now as i said before this does look quite com confusing does this one but we've tried it on people and they've figured it out pretty quickly because all the straps are color coordinated so we have several straps red white and blue go across the main section of the patient's body now you can see the white strap there unfortunately the the white tab is covered by the operator's hand there so you can't see the white tab there but it's just white to white red to red blue to blue and you just pull them tight okay and then orange and yellow go diagonally and you can see just near the bottom of the picture there on the straps one of the plugs so when the straps come up over the feet. That is one of the plugs that they will plug into there. Again, lower the bed, put it into a tilting position. And we simply, we drag the patient off the bottom of the bed and down the staircase. So that's a bariatric mat. And now the, finally, the ski sheet. Ski sheet, you will find these under the, um, the mattresses. And if you can see, the straps coming off to four corners there. So you'll find these straps underneath the, um, the mattress. And these straps here that you can see there, they're tucked into a little pocket on all four points. Right, so they're tucked into a pocket there. So to get to these, you'll need to put your hand under the mattress, find the little pockets and pull these straps out at all four points. And all as you do, it's a bit like the, uh, the ski pad. You just, there you can see it all laid out there. You've got the patient in there. And all as you do, we'll go back to it there. You can see the two straps are on either ends. They come up over the patient. And you've got your pillar in place. And you just plug it into there like that. Same with your seatbelt. 
same with the ski pad and you pull it nice and firmly tight any excess strap tuck under the pillar out of the way otherwise you will trip over it going down the staircase and again bed into a low position put it into a tilting position and again we drag the mattress this time so we're dragging the mattress and the patient off the bottom of the bed and away down the staircase and that's it so if there's any questions ladies and gentlemen thank you very much